Hello all you beautiful people out there and welcome. If you're new to my channel, why don't you go down, tap the subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss any episodes. For my fans and subscribers, welcome back. I really do appreciate you. You know you are the lifeblood of this channel. Today's topic, Daniel Nebuchadnezzar's Tree Dream Part 2. Let's go! Because it had a strong presence in Assyria, tree symbology probably was introduced to the Israelites this way. Through Assyrian dominance in the Near East, we also know that the Persians co-opted this practice. Nebuchadnezzar called Daniel a person in which the spirit of the gods dwelt. Incidentally, Pharaoh used a similar phrase for Joseph in Genesis 41:38, and it also refers back to Daniel 2, with Daniel successfully interpreting the king's dream. After this epistolary, the king relates his conversation with Daniel including his request for an interpretation and a recitation of the dream itself. This recitation includes not only prose, but at times editorial activity. Although the style does not indicate that an older piece of prose was incorporated, it does not preclude it either. Because of the eclecticism of the book, it is possible that the dream was a pre-existing piece of literature that was incorporated into the book of Daniel. The great tree is a widespread symbol in the ancient Near East, which can be found as early as the 4th millennium BCE, and in such diverse civilizations such as the Indus Valley, Egypt, and Greece. It was probably used to represent many ideas, the most common being fertility and life. Most of the time, it is depicted as a world tree integrating the spheres of the world and the wider cosmos. A winged sun sometimes accompanied this tree, which represented heaven, and it could also be associated with water under the earth. Naturally, the tree started to symbolize royalty. This can best be seen in Neo-Assyrian iconography, even though it was used much earlier. In this iconography, the tree lies under the winged sun disk, representing the god Asher who is attended by genies. Even in the Hebrew Bible, the tree represented the Davidic dynasty at times, with each king being designated as a branch. The texts that are most resembling of the ancient Near Eastern tradition are found in Daniel 4 and Ezekiel 31, which concern foreign kings. Because it had a strong presence in Assyria, the Israelites probably became acquainted with tree symbology through Assyrian dominance in the Near East. We also know that the Persians co-opted this practice. The writer starts to relate the dream in verse 10. The author identifies this world tree as being in the center of the earth and being of impressive height, telling us it was visible to the ends of the earth, which is, of course, impossible. This, my friends, is why you can't take the Bible literally. Verse 12 explains why the tree is important to the world. This tree provides food, protection, and a dwelling place for the animals. The dream then uses the tree as a symbol for the well-being of the world. 
verses 13 through 17 describes the second stage of the dream with repeated references to looking. This scene also features the destruction of the tree, although God commands it to be done through an angel instead of doing it himself, as in chapter 2. This makes people think that it may have been done through human agents. This messenger is described as a holy watcher. While this undeniably refers to an angel, the origin and connotation is uncertain. According to First Enoch, the watchers were angels that lusted after human women. These were the quote-unquote sons of God ret- referred to in Genesis that brought the flood of Noah. I will do an episode or two or three on the watchers, but from what I can tell, they were angels that were set about by God to watch over the earth, and these angels saw the daughters of men, and they said, we want to have sex with them, and so they did. This union then produced giants, which um, was, according to First Enoch, totally wreaking havoc on the earth. And according to First Enoch, this is why God flooded the earth. Daniel 4.14 describes the destruction of the tree, starting with the trunk and moving to the component parts. The destruction is halted, surprisingly, by another angel, calling for the preservation of the tree's base, a sign of possible renewal. The rest of the dream is somewhat hard to follow. At some point, the focus shifts from the tree to the king. And what is the significance of the band of iron and bronze? The best interpretation I've read goes back to Jerome, who sees this as the way in which a madman needs to be restrained, sort of like a very old version of the straitjacket. This defines some support with one of the versions referring to the king being bound with, quote, shackles, and bronze manacles, end quote. Each case in which the king is portrayed in shackles is coupled with him eating grass with the animals. Most likely, this refers to an alternative record stating that the king was restrained during this period. In verse 16, we find an important aspect of the king's punishment. Within ancient Near Eastern thought, three basic types of beings exist, identified by knowledge and rationality, deities, humans, and animals. Living like an animal was seen as an insult in the highest degree, and this phrase was often used as an ethnic slur. His punishment is to last seven times perhaps indicating seven years. If Daniel 4 draws on Nabonidus, this may be an adaptation of the Haran inscription, which states that Nabonidus sojourned in Taman for ten years. In Jewish tradition, seven is the symbol of completion, and so this would explain the change. The purpose of the punishment was to make both the king and his people realize the true nature and source of political sovereignty. More interestingly, we find within this cycle of stories a universal imperium, that is, the idea that all humanity is subject to one God. This concept reflects the ideology of the Persians, the period in which these stories likely took shape. And by the way, the Persian one god is Ahura Mazda. Um, I have made a video on him. Um, But 
the Israelites put Yahweh in there. Well, friends, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. There will be a part three and even possibly a part four to this. Um, there is a lot to unpack in this dream. A lot of imagery. And uh, so anyway, stay tuned for that. If you like this kind of content, please hit the like button, press the subscribe button, and if you want to know when I come out with new content, hit the bell next to the subscribe button. All social media links are in the description, along with the source that I used for this episode. If you wish to join this channel, the join link is right underneath the video. Keep learning and searching for truth. Here are a few videos from my library. If you have not watched them yet, go ahead and watch them and tell me what you think. Until next time, friends, stay safe and goodbye.